Chapter One of Uncanny Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rhiannon Damon. Uncanny Stories by May Sinclair. Where their fire is not quenched. There was nobody in the orchard. Harriet Lee went out, carefully, through the iron gate into the field. She had made the latch slip into its notch without a sound. The path slanted widely up the field from the orchard gate to the stile under the elder tree. George Waring waited for her there. Years afterwards, when she thought of George Waring, she smelt the sweet, hot wine-scent of the elder flowers. Years afterwards, when she smelt elder flowers, she saw George Waring, with his beautiful, gentle face, like a poet's or a musician's, his black-blue eyes, and sleek olive-brown hair. He was a naval lieutenant. Yesterday he had asked her to marry him, and she had consented. But her father hadn't, and she had come to tell him that and say good-bye before he left her. His ship was to sail the next day. He was eager and excited. He couldn't believe that anything could stop their happiness, that anything he didn't want to happen could happen. "'Well?' he said. "'He's a perfect beast, George. He won't let us. He says we're too young.' "'I was twenty last August,' he said, aggrieved. "'And I shall be seventeen in September. "'And this is June. We're quite old, really. How long does he mean us to wait?' Three years? Three years before we can be engaged, even? Why, we might be dead. She put her arms round him to make him feel safe. They kissed, and the sweet, hot wine scent of the elder flowers mixed with their kisses. They stood, pressed close together, under the elder tree. Across the yellow fields of Charlock they heard the village clock strike seven. Up in the house a gong clanged. Darling, I must go, she said. Oh, stay. Stay five minutes. He pressed her close. It lasted five minutes and five more. Then he was running fast down the road to the station, while Harriet went along the field path, slowly, struggling with her tears. He'll be back in three months, she said. I can live through three months. But he never came back. There was something wrong with the engines of his ship, the Alexandra. Three weeks later she went down in the Mediterranean, and George with her. Harriet said she didn't care how soon she died now. She was quite sure it would be soon, because she couldn't live without him. Five years passed. The two lines of beech trees stretched on and on, the whole length of the park, a broad green drive between. When you came to the middle they branched off right and left, in the form of a cross, and at the end of the right arm there was a white stucco pavilion with pillars and a three-cornered pediment like a Greek temple. At the end of the left arm the west entrance to the park, double gates and a side door. Harriet, on her stone seat at the back of the pavilion, could see Stephen Philpotts the very minute he came through the side door. He had asked her to wait for him there. It was the place he always chose to read his poems aloud in. The poems were a pretext. She knew what he was going to say, and she knew what she would answer. There were elder bushes and flower at the back of the pavilion, and Harriet thought of George Waring. She told herself that George was nearer to her now than he could ever have been, living. If she married Stephen, she would not be unfaithful, because she loved him with another part of herself. It was not as though Stephen were taking George's place. She loved Stephen with her soul in an unearthly way. But her body quivered like a stretched wire when the door opened, and the young man came towards her down the drive under the beech trees. She loved him. She loved his slenderness, his darkness and sallow whiteness, his black eyes lighting up with the intellectual flame, the way his black hair swept back from his forehead, the way he walked, tiptoe, as if his feet were lifted with wings. He sat down beside her. She could see his hands tremble. 
She felt that her moment was coming. It had come. I wanted to see you alone, because there's something I must say to you. I don't quite know how to begin. Her lips parted. She panted lightly. You've heard me speak of Sybil Foster? Her voice came stammering. N no Stephen. Did you? Well, I didn't mean to, till I knew it was all right. I only heard yesterday. Heard what? Why, that she'll have me. Oh, Harriet, do you know what it's like to be terribly happy? She knew. She had known just now, the moment before he told her. She sat there, stone cold and stiff, listening to his raptures, listening to her own voice saying she was glad. Ten years passed. Harriet Lee sat waiting in the drawing room of a small house in Maida Vale. She had lived there ever since her father's death two years before. She was restless. She kept on looking at the clock to see if it was four, the hour that Oscar Wade had appointed. She was not sure that he would come, after she had sent him away yesterday. She now asked herself why, when she had sent him away yesterday, she had let him come today. Her motives were not altogether clear. She really meant what she had said then. She oughtn't to let him come to her again. Never again. She had shown him plainly what she meant. She could see herself, sitting very straight in her chair, uplifted by a passionate integrity, while he stood before her, hanging his head, ashamed and beaten. She could feel again the throb in her voice as she kept on saying that she couldn't, she couldn't. He must see that she couldn't that no, nothing would make her change her mind. She couldn't forget he had a wife, that he must think of Muriel. To which he had answered savagely, I needn't. That's all over. We only live together for the look of the thing. And she, serenely, with great dignity, and for the look of the thing, Oscar, we must leave off seeing each other. Please go. Do you mean it? Yes. We must never see each other again. And he had gone then, ashamed and beaten. She could see him, squaring his broad shoulders to meet the blow. And she was sorry for him. She told herself she had been unnecessarily hard. Why shouldn't they see each other again? Now he understood where they must draw the line. Until yesterday, the line had never been very clearly drawn. Today, she meant to ask him to forget what he had said to her. Once it was forgotten, they could go on being friends as if nothing had happened. It was four o'clock, half-past, five. She had finished tea and given him up when, between the half-hour and six o'clock, he came. He came as he had come a dozen times, with his measured, deliberate, thoughtful tread, carrying himself well braced, with a sort of held-in arrogance, his great shoulders heaving. He was a man of about forty, broad and tall, lean-flanked and short-necked, his straight, handsome features showing small and even in the big square face and in the flush that swamped it. The close-clipped, reddish-brown mustache bristled forwards from the pushed-out upper lip. His small, flat eyes shone, reddish-brown, eager and animal. She liked to think of him when he was not there, but always at the first sight of him she felt a slight shock. Physically, it was very far from her admired ideal, so different from George Waring and Stephen Philpotts. He sat down, facing her. There was an embarrassed silence, broken by Oscar Wade. "'Well, Harriet, you said I could come.' He seemed to be throwing the responsibility on her. "'So uh, I suppose you've forgiven me?' he said. "'Oh, yes, Oscar, I've forgiven you.' He said she'd better show it by coming to dine with him somewhere that evening." She could give no reason to herself for going. She simply went. He took her to a restaurant in Soho. Oscar Wade dined well, even extravagantly, giving each dish its importance. She liked his extravagance. He had none of the mean virtues. It was over. His flushed, embarrassed silence told her what he was thinking, but when he had seen her home he left her at her garden gate. He had thought better of it. She was not sure whether she were glad or sorry. She had had her moment of righteous exultation, and she had enjoyed it. But there was no joy in the weeks that followed it. She had given up Oscar Wade because she didn't want him very much. 
and now she wanted him furiously, perversely, because she had given him up. Though he had no resemblance to her ideal, she couldn't live without him. She dined with him again and again, till she knew Schnebler's restaurant by heart, the white paneled walls picked out with gold, the white pillars, and the curling gold fronds of their capitals, the turkey carpets, blue and crimson, soft under her feet, the thick crimson velvet cushions that clung to her skirts, the glitter of silver and glass on the innumerable white circles on the tables, and the faces of the diners, red, white, pink, brown, gray and sallow, distorted and excited, the curled mouths that twisted as they ate, the convoluted electric bulbs pointing, pointing down at them, under the red, crinkled shades, all shimmering in a thick air that the red light stained as wine stains water, and Oscar's face, flushed with dinner, always, when he leaned back from the table and brooded in silence, she knew what he was thinking. His heavy eyelids would lift. She would find his eyes fixed on hers, wondering, considering. She knew now what the end would be. She thought of George Waring and Stephen Philpotts, and of her life, cheated. She hadn't chosen Oscar. She hadn't really wanted him. But now he had forced himself on her, she couldn't afford to let him go. Since George died... No man had loved her. No other man ever would. And she was sorry for him when she thought of him going from her, beaten and ashamed. She was certain, before he was, of the end. Only she didn't know when and where and how it would come. That was what Oscar knew. It came at the close of one of their evenings when they had dined in a private sitting-room. He said he couldn't stand the heat and noise of the public restaurant. She went before him, up a steep, red carpeted stair to a white door on the second landing from time to time they repeated the furtive hidden adventure sometimes she met him in the room above schnebler's sometimes when her maid was out she received him at her house and made a veil but that was dangerous not to be risked too often oscar declared himself unspeakably happy harriet was not quite sure this was love the thing she had never had that she had dreamed of, hungered and thirsted for. But now she had it, she was not satisfied. Always she looked for something just beyond it, some mystic, heavenly rapture, always beginning to come, that never came. There was something about Oscar that repelled her. But because she had taken him for her lover, she couldn't bring herself to admit that it was a certain coarseness. She looked another way and pretended it wasn't there. To justify herself, she fixed her mind on his good qualities, his generosity, his strength, the way he had built up his engineering business. She made him take her over his works and show her his great dynamos. She made him lend her the books he read. But always, when she tried to talk to him, he let her see that that wasn't what she was there for. "'My dear girl, we haven't time,' he said. "'It's a waste of our priceless moments.' She persisted. There's something wrong about it all if we can't talk to each other. He was irritated. Women never seem to consider that a man can get all the talk he wants from other men. What's wrong is our meeting in this unsatisfactory way. We ought to live together. It's the only sane thing. I would, only I don't want to break up Muriel's home and make her miserable. I thought you said she wouldn't care. My dear, she cares for her home and her position and the children. You forget the children. Yes, she had forgotten the children. She had forgotten Muriel. She had left off thinking of Oscar as a man with a wife and children and a home. He had a plan. His mother-in-law was coming to stay with Muriel in October, and he would get away. He would go to Paris, and Harriet should come to him there. He could say he went on business. No need to lie about it. He had business in Paris. He engaged rooms in a hotel in the Rue de Rivioli. They spent two weeks there. For three days Oscar was madly in love with Harriet, and Harriet with him. As she lay awake she would turn on the light and look at him as he slept at her side. Sleep made him beautiful and innocent. It laid a fine, smooth tissue over his coarseness. It made his mouth gentle. It entirely hid his eyes. In six days reaction had set in. At the end of the tenth day, Harriet, returning with Oscar from Montmartre, burst into a fit of crying. 
When questioned, she answered wildly that the Hotel Saint-Pierre was too hideously ugly it was getting on her nerves. Mercifully, Oscar explained her state as fatigue following excitement. She tried hard to believe that she was miserable because her love was purer and more spiritual than Oscar's, but all the time she knew perfectly well she had cried from pure boredom. She was in love with Oscar, and Oscar bored her. Oscar was in love with her, and she bored him. At close quarters, day in and day out, each was revealed to the other as an incredible bore. At the end of the second week, she began to doubt whether she had ever been really in love with him. Her passion returned for a little while after they got back to London. Freed from the unnatural strain which Paris had put on them, they persuaded themselves that their romantic temperaments were better fitted to the old life of casual adventure. Then, gradually, the sense of danger began to waken them. They lived in perpetual fear, face to face with all the chances of discovery. They tormented themselves and each other by imagining possibilities that they would never have considered in their first fine moments. It was as though they were beginning to ask themselves if it were, after all, worthwhile running such awful risks for all they got out of it. Oscar still swore that if he had been free, he would have married her. He pointed out that his intentions, at any rate, were regular. But she asked herself, would I marry him? Marriage would be the Hotel Saint-Pierre all over again, without any possibility of escape. But if she wouldn't marry him, was she in love with him? That was the test. Perhaps it was a good thing he wasn't free. Then she told herself that these doubts were morbid and that the question wouldn't arise. One evening Oscar called to see her. He had come to tell her that Muriel was ill. Seriously ill? I'm afraid so. It's pleurisy. May turn to pneumonia. We shall know one way or another in the next few days. A terrible fear seized upon Harriet. Muriel might die of her pleurisy, and if Muriel died, she would have to marry Oscar. He was looking at her queerly, as if he knew what she was thinking, and she could see that the same thought had occurred to him, and that he was frightened too. Muriel got well again but their danger had enlightened them. Muriel's life was now inconceivably precious to them both. She stood between them and that permanent union, which they dreaded and yet would not have the courage to refuse. After enlightenment, the rupture. It came from Oscar, one evening when he sat with her in her drawing-room. Harriet, he said, do you know I'm thinking seriously of settling down? How do you mean, settling down? Patching it up with Muriel, poor girl. Has it never occurred to you that this little affair of ours can't go on forever? You don't want it to go on? I don't want to have any humbug about it. For God's sake, let's be straight. If it's done, it's done. Let's end it decently. I see. You want to get rid of me. That's a beastly way of putting it. Is there any way that isn't beastly? The whole thing's beastly. I should have thought you'd have stuck to it now you've made it what you wanted. When I haven't an ideal, I haven't a single illusion, when you've destroyed everything you didn't want. What didn't I want? The clean, beautiful part of it. The part I wanted. My part, at least, was real. It was cleaner and more beautiful than all that putrid stuff you wrapped it up in. You were a hypocrite, Harriet, and I wasn't. You're a hypocrite now if you say you weren't happy with me. I was never really happy. Never for one moment. There was always something I missed, something you didn't give me. Perhaps you couldn't. No, I wasn't spiritual enough, he sneered. You were not, and you made me what you were. Oh, I noticed that you were always very spiritual after you got what you wanted. What I wanted? she cried. Oh, my God! If you ever knew what you wanted. What I wanted! she repeated, drawing out her bitterness. Come, he said, why not be honest? Face facts. I was awfully gone on you. You were awfully gone on me. Once. We got tired of each other, and it's over. But at least you might own we had a good time while it lasted. A good time? Good enough for me. For you. 
because for you love only means one thing everything that's high and noble in it you drag down to that till there's nothing left for us but that that's what you made of love twenty years passed it was oscar who died first three years after the rupture he did it suddenly one evening falling down in a fit of apoplexy his death was an immense relief to harriet perfect security had been impossible as long as he was alive but now there wasn't a living soul who knew her secret still in the first moment of shock harriet told herself that oscar dead would be nearer to her than ever she forgot how little she had wanted him to be near her alive and long before the twenty years had passed she had contrived to persuade herself that he had never been near to her at all it was incredible that she had ever known such a person as oscar wade as for their affair she couldn't think of harriet lee as the sort of woman to whom such a thing could happen schnebler's and the hotel st pierre ceased to figure among prominent images of her past her memories if she had allowed herself to remember would have clashed disagreeably with the reputation for sanctity which she had now acquired for harriet at fifty-two was the friend and helper of the reverend clement farmer vicar of st mary the virgins made of ale she worked as a deaconess in his parish wearing the uniform of a deaconess the semi-religious gown the cloak the bonnet and veil the cross and rosary the holy smile she was also secretary to the maida vale and kilburn home for fallen girls her moments of excitement came when clement farmer the lean austere likeness of stephen philpotts in his cassock and lace-bordered surplice issued from the vestry when he mounted the pulpit when he stood before the altar rails and lifted up his arms in the benediction her moments of ecstasy when she received the sacrament from his hands and she had moments of calm happiness when a study door closed on their communion all these moments were saturated with a solemn holiness and they were insignificant compared with the moment of her dying she lay dozing in her white bed under the black crucifix with the ivory christ the basins and medicine bottles had been cleared from the table by her pillow it was spread for the last rites the priest moved quietly about the room arranging the candles the prayer book and the holy sacrament then he drew a chair to her bedside and watched with her waiting for her to come up out of her doze she woke suddenly her eyes were fixed upon him she had a flash of lucidity she was dying and her dying made her supremely important to clement farmer are you ready he asked not yet i think i'm afraid make me not afraid he rose and lit the two candles on the altar he took down the crucifix from the wall and stood it against the footrail of the bed she sighed that was not what she had wanted you will not be afraid now he said i'm not afraid of the hereafter i suppose you get used to it only it may be terrible just at first our first state will depend very much on what we are thinking of at our last hour there'll be my confession she said and after it you will receive the sacrament then you will have your mind fixed firmly upon god and your redeemer do you feel able to make your confession now sister everything is ready her mind went back over her past and found oscar wade there she wondered should she confess to him about oscar wade one moment she thought it was possible the next she knew that she couldn't she could not it wasn't necessary for twenty years he had not been part of her life no she wouldn't confess about oscar wade she had been guilty of other sins she made a careful selection i have cared too much for the beauty of this world i have failed in charity to my poor girls because of my intense repugnance to their sin i have thought often about people i love when i should have been thinking about god after that she received the sacrament now he said there is nothing to be afraid of i won't be afraid if if you would hold my hand he held it and she lay still a long time with her eyes shut then he heard her murmuring something he stooped close 
This is dying. I thought it would be horrible. And it's bliss. Bliss. The priest's hand slackened, as if at the bidding of some wonder. She gave a weak cry. Oh, don't let me go. His grasp tightened. Try, he said, to think about God. Keep on looking at the crucifix. If I look, she whispered, you won't let go of my hand? I will not let you go. He held it till it was wrenched from him in the last agony. She lingered for some hours in the room where these things had happened. Its aspect was familiar and yet unfamiliar, and slightly repugnant to her. The altar, the crucifix, the lighted candles, suggested some tremendous and awful experience, the details of which she was not able to recall. She seemed to remember that they had been connected in some way with the sheeted body on the bed, but the nature of the connection was not clear, and she did not associate the dead body with herself. When the nurse came in and laid it out, she saw that it was the body of a middle-aged woman. Her own living body was that of a young woman of about thirty-two. Her mind had no past and no future, no sharp-edged coherent memories, and no idea of anything to be done next. Then, suddenly, the room began to come apart before her eyes, to split into shafts of floor and furniture and ceiling that shifted and were thrown by their commotion into different planes. They leaned slanting at every possible angle. They crossed and overlaid each other with a transparent mingling of dislocated perspectives, like reflections fallen on an interior scene behind glass. The bed and the sheeted body slid away, somewhere out of sight. She was standing by the door that still remained in position. She opened it and found herself in the street, outside a building of yellowish-gray brick and freestone, with a tall slated spire. Her mind came together with a palpable click of recognition. This object was the church of St. Mary the Virgin, made of ale. She could hear the droning of the organ. She opened the door and slipped in. She had gone back into a definite space and time, and recovered a certain limited section of coherent memory. She remembered the rows of pitch-pine benches, with their gothic peaks and moldings, the stone-colored walls and pillars with their chocolate stenciling, the hanging rings of lights along the aisles of the nave, the high altar with its lighted candles and the polished brass cross twinkling. These things were somehow permanent and real, adjusted to the image that now took possession of her. She knew what she had come there for. The service was over. The choir had gone from the chancel. The sacristan moved before the altar, putting out the candles. She walked up the middle aisle to a seat that she knew under the pulpit. She knelt down and covered her face with her hands. Peeping sideways through her fingers, she could see the door of the vestry on her left at the end of the north aisle. She watched it steadily. Up in the organ loft, the organist drew out the recessional, slowly and softly, to its end in the two solemn, vibrating chords. The vestry door opened, and Clement Farmer came out, dressed in his black cassock. He passed before her, close, close outside the bench where she knelt. He paused at the opening. He was waiting for her. There was something he had to say. She stood up and went towards him. He still waited. He didn't move to make way for her. She came close, closer than she had ever come to him, so close that his features grew indistinct. She bent her head back, peering, short-sightedly, and found herself looking into Oscar Wade's face. He stood still, horribly still, and close, barring her passage. She drew back. His heaving shoulders followed her. He leaned forward, covering her with his eyes. She opened her mouth to scream, and no sound came. She was afraid to move, lest he should move with her. The heaving of his shoulders terrified her. One by one the lights in the side aisles were going out. The lights in the middle aisle would go next. They had gone. If she didn't get away, she would be shut up with him there, in the appalling darkness. She turned and moved towards the north aisle, groping, steadying herself by the book ledge. When she looked back, Oscar Wade was not there. 
Then she remembered that Oscar Wade was dead. Therefore, what she had seen was not Oscar. It was his ghost. He was dead. Dead seventeen years ago. She was safe from him forever. When she came out on to the steps of the church, she saw that the road it stood in had changed. It was not the road she remembered. The pavement on this side was raised slightly and covered in. It ran under a succession of arches. It was a long gallery walled with glittering shop windows on one side, on the other a line of tall gray columns divided it from the street. She was going along the arcades of the Rue des Rivioli. Ahead of her she could see the edge of an immense gray pillar jutting out. That was the porch of the Hotel St. Pierre. The revolving glass doors swung forward to receive her. She crossed the gray, sultry vestibule under the pillared arches. She knew it. She knew the porter's shining, wine-colored mahogany pen on her left, and the shining, wine-colored mahogany barrier of the clerk's bureau on her right. She made straight for the great, gray, carpeted staircase. She climbed the endless flights that turned round and round the caged-in shaft of the well, past the latticed doors of the lift, and came up on to a landing that she knew, and into the long, ash-gray, foreign corridor lit by a dull window at one end. It was there that the horror of the place came on her. She had no longer any memory of St. Mary's Church, so that she was unaware of her backward course through time. All space and time were here. She remembered she had to go to the left. The left. But there was something there, where the corridor turned by the window at the end of all the corridors. If she went the other way she would escape it. The corridor stopped there. A blank wall. She was driven back past the stairhead to the left. At the corner, by the window, she turned down another long, ash-gray corridor on her right, and to the right again, where the night light sputtered on the table flap at the turn. This third corridor was dark and secret and depraved. She knew the soiled walls and the warped door at the end. There was a sharp, pointed streak of light at the top. She could see the number on it now. 107. Something had happened there. If she went in, it would happen again. Oscar Wade was in the room, waiting for her behind the closed door. She felt him moving about in there. She leaned forward, her ear to the keyhole, and listened. She could hear the measured, deliberate, thoughtful footsteps. They were coming from the bed to the door. She turned and ran. Her knees gave way under her. She sank and ran on down the long, gray corridors and the stairs, quick and blind, a hunted beast seeking for cover, hearing his feet coming after her. The revolving doors caught her and pushed her out into the street. The strange quality of her state was this, that it had no time. She remembered dimly that there had once been a thing called time, but she had forgotten altogether what it was like. She was aware of things happening and about to happen. She fixed them by the place they occupied, and measured their duration by the space she went through. So now she thought, if I could only go back and get to the place where it hadn't happened, to get back farther. She was walking now on a white road that went between broad grass borders. To the right and left were the long raking lines of the hills, curve after curve, shimmering in a thin mist. The road dropped to the green valley. It mounted the humped bridge over the river. Beyond it she saw the twin gables of the gray house, pricked up over the high, gray garden wall. The tall iron gate stood in front of it between the ball-topped stone pillars. And now she was in a large, low-ceilinged room with drawn blinds. She was standing before the wide double bed. It was her father's bed. The dead body, stretched out in the middle under the drawn white sheet, was her father's body. The outline of the sheet sank from the peak of the upturned toes to the shin-bone, and from the high bridge of the nose to the chin. She lifted the sheet and folded it back across the breast of the dead man. The face she saw then was Oscar Wade's face, stilled and smoothed in the innocence of sleep, the supreme innocence of death. She stared at it, fascinated, in a cold, pitiless joy. Oscar was dead. She remembered how he used to lie like that beside her in the room in the Hotel St. Pierre, 
on his back with his hands folded on his waist, his mouth half open, his big chest rising and falling. If he was dead, it would never happen again. She would be safe. The dead face frightened her, and she was about to cover it up again when she was aware of a light heaving, a rhythmical rise and fall. As she drew the sheet up tighter, the hands under it began to struggle convulsively. The broad ends of the fingers appeared above the edge, clutching it to keep it down. The mouth opened. The eyes opened. The whole face stared back at her in a look of agony and horror. Then the body drew itself forwards from the hips and sat up, its eyes peering into her eyes. He and she remained for an instant motionless, each held there by the other's fear. Suddenly she broke away, turned and ran, out of the room, out of the house. She stood at the gate, looking up and down the road, not knowing by which way she must go to escape Oscar. To the right, over the bridge and up the hill and across the downs, she would come to the arcades of the Rue des Rivioli and the dreadful grey corridors of the hotel. To the left, the road went through the village. If she could get further back, she would be safe out of Oscar's reach. Standing by her father's deathbed she had been young, but not young enough. She must get back to the place where she was younger still, to the park and the green drive under the beech trees and the white pavilion at the cross. She knew how to find it. At the end of the village the high road ran right and left, east and west, under the park walls. The south gate stood there at the top, looking down the narrow street. She ran towards it through the village, past the long grey barns of Goodyear's farm, past the grocer's shop, past the yellow front and blue sign of the Queen's Head, past the post office with its one black window blinking under its vine, past the church and the yew trees in the churchyard, to where the south gate made a delicate pattern on the green grass. These things appeared insubstantial, drawn back behind a sheet of air that shimmered over them like thin glass. They opened out, floated past and away from her, and instead of the high road and park walls, she saw a London street of dingy white facades, and instead of the south gate, the swinging glass doors of Schnebler's restaurant. The glass doors swung open and she passed into the restaurant. The scene beat on her with the hard impact of reality. The white and gold panels, the white pillars and their curling gold capitals, the white circles of the tables glittering, the flushed faces of the diners, moving mechanically. She was driven forward by some irresistible compulsion to a table in the corner, where a man sat alone. The table napkin he was using hid his mouth and jaw and chest, and she was not sure of the upper part of the face above the straight-drawn edge. It dropped, and she saw Oscar Wade's face. She came to him, dragged, without power to resist. She sat down beside him, and he leaned to her over the table. She could feel the warmth of his red, congested face. The smell of wine floated towards her on his thick whisper. I knew you would come. She ate and drank with him in silence, nibbling and sipping slowly, staving off the abominable moment it would end. At last they got up and faced each other. His long bulk stood before her, above her. She could almost feel the vibration of its power. Come, he said come. And she went before him, slowly, slipping out through the maze of the tables, hearing behind her Oscar's measured, deliberate, thoughtful tread. The steep, red-carpeted staircase rose up before her. She swerved from it, but he turned her back. "'You know the way,' he said. At the top of the flight she found the white door of the room she knew. She knew the long windows guarded by drawn muslin blinds the gilt looking-glass over the chimney-piece that reflected Oscar's head and shoulders grotesquely between two white porcelain babies with bulbous limbs and garlanded loins. She knew the sprawling stain on the drab carpet by the table, the shabby, infamous couch behind the screen. They moved about the room, turning and turning in it like beasts in a cage, uneasy, inimical, avoiding each other. At last they stood still, he at the window, she at the door, the length of the room between. "'It's no good you're getting away like that,' he said. "'There couldn't be any other end to it. 
to what we did. But that was ended. Ended there, but not here. Ended forever. We've done with it forever. We haven't. We've got to begin again and go on and go on. Oh, no, no, anything but that. There isn't anything else. We can't. We can't. Don't you remember how it bored us? Remember? Do you suppose I'd touch you if I could help it? That's what we're here for. We must. We must. No. No. I shall get away. Now. She turned to the door to open it. You can't, he said. The door's locked. Oscar, what did you do that for? We always did it. Don't you remember? She turned to the door again and shook it. She beat on it with her hands. It's no use, Harriet. If you go out now, you'd only have to come back again. You might stave it off for an hour or so. But what's that in an immortality? Immortality? That's what we're in for. Time enough to talk about immortality when we're dead. Ah! They were being drawn towards each other across the room, moving slowly, like figures in some monstrous and appalling dance, their heads thrown back over their shoulders, their faces turned from the horrible approach. Their arms rose slowly, heavy with intolerable reluctance. They stretched them out towards each other, aching, as if they held up an overpowering weight. Their feet dragged and were drawn. Suddenly, her knees sank under her. She shut her eyes. All her being went down before him in darkness and terror. It was over. She had got away. She was going back, back, to the green drive of the park, between the beech trees, where Oscar had never been, where he would never find her. When she passed through the south gate, her memory became suddenly young and clean. She forgot the Rue des Rivioli and the Hotel Saint-Pierre. She forgot Schnebler's restaurant and the room at the top of the stairs. She was back in her youth. She was Harriet Lee, going to wait for Stephen Philpotts in the pavilion opposite the west gate. She could feel herself, a slender figure, moving fast over the grass between the lines of the great beech trees. The freshness of her youth was upon her. She came to the heart of the drive, where it branched right and left in the form of a cross. At the end of the right arm, the white Greek temple, with its pediment and pillars, gleamed against the wood. She was sitting on their seat at the back of the pavilion, watching the side door that Stephen would come in by. The door was pushed open. He came towards her, light and young, skimming between the beech trees with his eager, tiptoeing stride. She rose up to meet him. She gave a cry. Stephen! It had been Stephen. She had seen him coming. But the man who stood before her between the pillars of the pavilion was Oscar Wade. And now she was walking along the field path that slanted from the orchard door to the stile, further and further back, to where young George Waring waited for her under the elder tree. The smell of the elder flowers came to her over the field. She could feel on her lips and in all her body the sweet, innocent excitement of her youth. George! Oh, George! As she went along the field path she had seen him, but the man who stood waiting for her, under the elder tree, was Oscar Wade. I told you it's no use getting away, Harriet. Every path brings you back to me. You'll find me at every turn. But how did you get here? As I got into the pavilion, as I got into your father's room, onto his deathbed, because I was there. I am in all your memories. My memories are innocent. How could you take my father's place, and Stevens, and George Waring's? You! Because I did take them. Never. My love for them was innocent. Your love for me was part of it. You think the past affects the future? Has it never struck you that the future may affect the past? In your innocence, there was the beginning of your sin. You were what you were to be. I shall get away, she said. And, this time, I shall go with you. 
The stile, the elder tree, and the field floated away from her. She was going under the beech trees down the park drive, towards the south gate and the village, slinking close to the right-hand row of trees. She was aware that Oscar Wade was going with her under the left-hand row, keeping even with her, step by step and tree by tree. And presently there was grey pavement under her feet and a row of grey pillars on her right hand. They were walking side by side down the Rue des Rivioli towards the hotel. They were sitting together now on the edge of the dingy white bed. Their arms hung by their sides, heavy and limp, their heads drooped, averted. Their passion weighed on them with the unbearable, unescapable boredom of immortality. Oscar, how long will it last? I can't tell you. I don't know whether this is one moment of eternity, or the eternity of one moment. It must end some time, she said. Life doesn't go on forever. We shall die. Die? We have died. Don't you know what this is? Don't you know where you are? This is death. We're dead, Harriet. We're in hell. Yes, there can't be anything worse than this. This isn't the worst. We're not quite dead yet. As long as we've life in us to turn and run and get away from each other. As long as we can escape into our memories. But when you've got back to the farthest memory of all, and there's nothing beyond it, when there's no memory but this. In the last hell, we shall not run away any longer. We shall find no more roads, no more passages, no more open doors. We shall have no need to look for each other. In the last death, we shall be shut up in this room, behind that locked door, together. We shall lie here together, forever and ever, joined so fast that even God can't put us asunder. We shall be one flesh and one spirit, one sin repeated forever and ever. Spirit-loathing flesh, flesh-loathing spirit, you and I loathing each other. Why? Why? she cried. Because that's all that's left us. That's what you made of love. The darkness came down, swamping. It blotted out the room. She was walking along a garden path between high borders of phlox and larkspur and lupin. They were taller than she was. Their flowers swayed and nodded above her head. She tugged at the tall stems and had no strength to break them. She was a little thing. She said to herself then that she was safe. She had gone back so far that she was a child again. She had the blank innocence of childhood. To be a child, to go small under the heads of the lupins, to be blank and innocent, without memory, was to be safe. The walk led her out through a yew hedge onto a bright green lawn. In the middle of the lawn there was a shallow round pond in a ring of rockery cushioned with small flowers, yellow and white and purple, Goldfish swam in the olive-brown water. She would be safe when she saw the goldfish swimming towards her. The old one with the white scales would come up first, pushing up his nose, making bubbles in the water. At the bottom of the lawn there was a privet hedge cut by a broad path that went through the orchard. She knew what she would find there. Her mother was in the orchard. She would lift her up in her arms to play with the hard red balls of the apples that hung from the tree. She had got back to the farthest memory of all. There was nothing beyond it. There would be an iron gate in the wall of the orchard. It would lead into a field. Something was different here. Something that frightened her. An ash-gray door instead of an iron gate. She pushed it open and came into the last corridor of the Hotel St. Pierre. End of Chapter One